All right, so way back in March of this year, I had the absolute pleasure of being able to interview one of my friends in magic, fellow magician Jonathan Molo. Now, he does a bunch of nonprofit work. He's a performing member uh, at the Academy of Magical Arts at the world famous Magic Castle in California. He's a great guy. And I got to interview him when I was back in college uh, on Zoom. And I wanted to make this video to sort of show the best parts of that interview and make a sort of best of. I'm going to be narrating over the interview myself because uh, the way I asked questions is kind of kind of weird. And he managed to make great answers out of them anyways. So I wanted to sort of use this as a structure for that video uh, and make it easier to watch. As I posted on my blog uh, a text version of all this where you can find written transcripts of all of the answers that Jonathan gave. So if you want to check that out, go to markomachoni.com slash blog and find this article and you can read along if you want oh and actually before we start this interview i want to do this in the beginning uh so we so we don't forget follow him on instagram at molo underscore magic or visit his website jonathanmolo.com to learn more about booking him if you're in the los angeles area with that out of the way Perfect. Let's, let's get right into the interview. To start out the interview, we sort of started talking about magic uh, in the sense of like how unique it is, right? Uh, how and why it's kept us around and interested for so long. So here's what Jonathan had to say about that. I am Jonathan Molo. I'm known as the man in the purple suit. I am the official magician of the nonprofit organizations Rock and Art Disabilities and Autism Eats. I'm also a performing member of the Academy of Magical Arts at the world famous Magic Castle in Hollywood. And uh, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been sharing my magic for uh, since I was uh, 10 years old and I'm 43 now. Uh, and, but uh, most of my life uh, I've been a hobbyist, mm -hmm. but uh, the last uh, 10 plus years, I I've taken it uh, se uh, semi-professionally because I do have a day job. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you count the hours and how many shows that I, I put into magic, it's it's pre it's full time. It's one it's one of those hobbies that just kind of is like let's be like it surrounds us. You know what I mean? You can't really you can't really. Uh, man, you know it's funny because I've in my lifetime, like most people, I've had many hobbies, but uh, uh, the nothing transcended like magic does. It's usually I would leave those hobbies to the wayside but magic has stuck with me bro it's it's something that is very very special to me very special to my family mm -hmm. and uh, you know i'll probably be doing it till the day i die man what do you think like differentiates magic from other performing arts like i guess you, you can compare it sort of to many performing like even stand-up comedy in terms of the sure. interaction between audience member and performer what do you think like differentiates magic the thing is is i i, I don't have any comparison because i i've never been a musician yeah. i've never been a comedian or anything like that but i mean we share we make the impossible possible uh we 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 make those miracles happen uh in front of people i, I guess uh, but you know uh, in other arts i'm not i'm not degrading any other arts like you know musicians put in a lot of hard work and some people consider that magic also in a, in a different way or uh yeah it's they're all very similar but you know magic you know we we bring that extra oomph i, I i'm biased mm. because we're magicians we're both uh, biased. <laughs> yeah we're both biased it's just we bring that little extra impossibility to it and not too many people can do that uh i can't play the guitar but i i can learn how to play the guitar and i guess you can learn how to uh i don't know, do a magic trick but at the end of the day i think there's more to it than just doing just magic so from the very beginning of this interview, it became clear to me that Jonathan felt that there was more to magic than just having physical skill and that it was really about connecting with your audience. But at the end of the day, I think there's more to it than just doing just magic, you know, magic trick. Anybody can do a magic trick, but kind of extracting that magic uh, is the, the magical part to it, if that made any sense. I don't, I don't know. No, no, definitely. I, I completely agree. Because, you know, like, that, that's the comparison that a lot of people make, where it's like, you can have the most technically amazing trick ever, the trick that will fool every magician. But, like, what, what a lot of people say is they say that even when people do these tricks, like, they don't get the best reactions from, from spectators. Meanwhile, I think this magician made this comparison to, like, I, like Eugene Berger and just other magicians who, like, take this, like, very simple trick and flesh it out to where it's, it's, not, it's about the interaction and also just like the personality performer, it, that's very underestimated. No, and you're, you, you know what? I, I just spoke, uh, I did a podcast with my friend Danny, uh, a comedian out in uh, Tennessee, Tennessee, I think. And we were talking about that. Yeah. 
magicians, especially when I first started, magicians don't understand how much power they have. Not power uh, in regards to like, you know, I, I, you know, I own you or anything like that, but it's the power of emotion, how much emotion you can extract. I've done shows and I've done routines where I, I look at out in the crowd and somebody's crying and I'm like, but it's not tears of like, I hurt them or anything like that. It, it, it brought back a memory in their head. And when I, when I go, uh, when, after I, uh, my show's over, I go and uh, talk to them and I'm like, ah, I'm so sorry, what happened? You know, you're crying. And then they're like, you know, you, that trick that you did, it, it reminded me of my father or it reminded me uh, of a time in my childhood that was really important to me. And that is like super powerful, just like music because music does the same thing. But as a performer, uh, it's not just like pick a card, any card. If you can, I'm not saying you have to have a long drawn out story that's most of like 80% of it is not true. But if you can express your humanity and build that connection with your audience, that dude, that's magic. That's the magical part that a lot of magicians are missing. Eventually, in one of his answers, Jonathan ended up bringing up a book by Ken Weber called Maximum Entertainment, which is a very popular book in the magic community. Uh, and I asked him what his favorite takeaway was or if there was something in it that really made him like a big aha moment or something to that effect. And here's what he had to say about that. You know, an important book that I've, re I've read many, many times that I actually just got finished reading, I usually read it after every uh, major performance that I have. Yeah. is uh, Maximum Entertainment by Ken Weber. Uh, it's such an important book. Magicians out there, there's no magic tricks in this book, but it's the just uh, the theory of performing. Uh, anything from like scripting to the hierarchy of magic, of what type of, uh, you know, what type of reactions you want to, uh, grasp from your 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 spectators it's such an important book and if you want to take your magic to the next level and this is something that you know i want to do for the rest of my life why not do it correctly read that book it's very good and of course the rules might not apply to everybody but it's it's a it's definitely a good stepping stone to see you know where you're at uh in your you know and you're performing your magic yeah, I've heard a lot of a lot of really good things about that book. I think there's even like a second version that's like yeah. like a, like a two point or something. So I I definitely I'm definitely gonna check that book out. What do you think? Is there like one specific point or a couple of specific points that like Ken makes that like you really resonate with you that like you reread it and you're like, oh my god, this right here. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's just expressing your humanity. We we spoke about this earlier. You brought it up. Expressing you your humanity as a magician, not even as a magician, as a person. Uh, you know, because one of the rules that I was given from my mentor, uh, he said, if they like you, they'll like what you do. And it stands true because I see some magicians, especially uh, beginners, they, they, would, uh, they would present it as a challenge. Like, watch what I can do. I bet you can't do it either. So now you are like behind uh, uh, with because now you exp you you made a challenge to your your audience. So if you made a challenge to the wrong person, that's when you get uh, those those people that are give you that'll give you a hard time. You want to accept the challenge? Yeah, yeah, they'll they'll accept the challenge and they'll be like, oh no, I saw it, I saw it. They're gonna I saw it. You put it in your pocket or you did this, you did that. And when a, a lot of beginners would ask me like, how do you deal with hecklers? I rarely have hecklers. It's just one of those things. Every now and then I'll, I'll have somebody. Uh, but the thing is, is not well, another rule is not everybody loves magic. Not everybody loves magic. You have to realize that. Uh, even if you feel like it's special to you, some people just don't like it. And it's not our job to stuff it down somebody's throat. It's your job. Usually if I go to a table and I'm like, hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm a magician, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to see something really quick? And every, every now and then I get somebody like, no, no, thank you. I don't like magic. 
I'm not there to prove that you like magic or not. I just say, well, thank you so much. If you if you ch if you want to see some magic a little later, uh, please let me know. And I'll be right back. And uh, you know, it's just you just cut your losses. You're, you, it's just one of those things. It's just, if they don't like magic, they don't like magic. From here, I then asked Jonathan about his humanity on stage and if this was something he's always been doing or if this is something he had to learn. Uh, you know, in the beginning, it, it was. It's something that I, I had to learn uh, mm -hmm. because, because I, I'm not going to – I I was like those those magicians that I was talking about. I was just like, watch what I can do. This is cool. You can't do this. And then – as my journey progressed, you know, that I learned that's not correct after reading books, after uh, being taught by different people that this is the way you, you should uh, present your magic because now uh, you're not expressing it, you're not uh, presenting it as a challenge. Uh, so it was definitely something learned. And from this answer, he gave some advice to performers that I really didn't see coming and I thought it was kind of cool. One of the other tips that I can give you, uh, because I began as a close-up magician, uh, you know, I love cards. I love coins. I love the intimacy of close-up magic. Uh, but I challenge all of you out there, close-up magician or not, to do kid shows. The reason why there's a lot of lessons that can be learned uh, doing kid shows. It'll teach you patience for sure. It'll teach you audience management. It'll teach you uh, because with children's magic it's not about the 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 punch at the end it's not about the the the, the destination it's about the journey you take them on it's all about the entertainment yeah. uh, the fart jokes the, the like the, the slapstick humor i'm not saying you can incorporate that uh into your close-up material but that energy that you bring that entertainment that you bring to kid shows that's what you can bring over to uh your your close-up magic yeah, and you know what? I can kind of think about it now that you said that. It's kind of like uh, performing magic for kids is kind of like a hyperbolized version of performing for adults, right? Because kids, sure. if you take them on this long 10-minute any card to any number routine, they will get bored after the first four minutes. They wouldn't they don't care. Kids have no filter, sure. right? So I guess what you're, what you're saying oh, is, don't. but it's like a hyperbolized version of what these are, what sure. the adults would do. Because, you know, the adults might get bored too. And if you even if it has the craziest any card, any number, and it works, yeah. the, kids, the kids are maybe going to be a a little bit um you know impressed about that one part but they wouldn't really like it's no more about your thing you know, you're and, you know and, and it's just not kids either it's uh, adults too you there yeah. are there are magic tricks out there there are routines out there that are amazing but are they entertaining and will they put me to sleep probably all right from here jonathan brought up his distaste for a question that he sees asked on a lot of magic forums such as the magic cafe uh, and the basic question is, uh, what do you choose, magic or entertainment? Meaning, you know, that they're sort of mutually exclusive. Here's what you had to say about that. You know, I thought about this the other day. One of the questions that I see the most often in, often in uh, um, you know, Facebook, magician Facebook groups or the Magic Cafe and stuff, which one do you choose? Do you choose entertainment or magic? <laughs> which one do you choose? And I think that is the most stupidest question because... You could combine the two. There is, there's no like, I'd rather have more entertainment than magic. You can, it is possible, more than possible. I've seen it where you can combine powerful magic with entertain, uh, entertaining uh, presentations. It's just, it's not a valid question. Uh, people still need to stop asking that question. It's just, it's, it's not valid. Where, where did you find that question? Who, who asked that? I see it all the time. I see it on like, uh, uh, any Facebook uh, magic group or any of the magic cafe, it's, it's been asked many, many times. As a magician, which do you choose? Do you choose entertainment or do you choose magic? Which is more important? They're both important. They're very both important because if we were just doing entertaining, we'd be an entertainer. Are you really a magician? Not really. But if you're doing powerful magic at the same time and you combine the two, then you're doing your job as a magician. Because Jonathan is the official magician of both Rock and Our Disabilities and Autism Eats, I decided to ask him about his charity work, and here's what he had to say about that. Because you, you talked about uh, your Rock and Our Disabilities, and I think you, you said you perform shows for them, right? And, and sure. you, So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I've, uh, I don't have any family members uh, that uh, are on the spectrum or that have any uh, type of uh, disabilities. 
I, I kind of fell into it. Uh, I had an organization uh, called Autism Eats contact me asking if I would be up to doing a sensory friendly show. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. I, I'm, I don't know. So I, I contacted a lot of magicians on Facebook that had uh, experience with uh, these type of shows. And I did my studying and I, I did my first show almost uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, not 10 years, five years ago, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, now it's, I do pre-pandemic, I, I do at least two to three shows with uh, uh, another organization called Rock and Our Disabilities. Uh, and uh, m my shows are sensory friendly and they're just, well, what's great about this though, is that I, yeah, they become family to me because I see the same people uh, most of the time that, you know, that are at these events. And now I know them by name and they're friends of mine, they're family members of mine. You know, it's just, it's it's an amazing community uh, that, you know, that that I <laughs> hold a special place in my heart. We then got into his motivation for performing, deep topics where he said that his three sons, Asher, Lennon, and Sebastian, uh, make him strive to be a better person and consequently a better performer. Take a look at this. I appreciate the kind words. You know, honestly, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, people have different reasons to do these type of things. And whatever your reason is, you know, that's that's your reason. Uh, my reason is, is that I have three boys. I have Asher, Lennon, and Sebastian. Uh, they, uh, five, seven, and 14. And I, uh, my day job, I work with the U.S. military, the U.S. Army, and I'm in their training area. And one day, uh, I, um, in the training area, I came, it was a really close call. I, I was driving right by a tank, and uh, I'm just like, this is it. This is, this is it for me. So when I got home, I, I was just like, uh, man, you know, I, I could have not come home today. It's just one of those things. Uh, and it, it really, what I thought in my head, I thought about my boys. Like, if I left today, if I was done today, what kind of legacy would I leave my kids? And it, it really bothered me because I'll be honest with you, I was kind of a crappy human being in my younger years. I was very selfish. I did my own thing. And, you know, sometimes I could be still selfish, but I, I, I just wasn't happy with a lot of lessons learned, but I, ju I just wasn't happy with the way, you know, I led my life. I, I took it upon myself. This happened uh, in, uh, when I was uh, in my late uh, 30s. And I, I, I took it upon myself to, to make a blueprint to lead my life. Uh, if I wasn't here, they would remember or they were would have been told that your dad did this because out of the kind of his of his heart. And not because because a lot of people do this, which is, I don't I don't know if it's human nature or not. And maybe I still do it like subconsciously, but people do things for people because sometimes they'll get something in return or they'll like, I have people like, Hey, do you remember I did this for you? Uh, I need, I need, uh, that, uh, favor return. And you know, that that's fine and dandy, uh, but I'm trying my best as a human being to do things, not because it's going to take me to stardom. It's going to give me money. It's going to, you know, boost my ego. Uh, it, it's because, you should do things because you care about people. You, you should do things out of the kindness of your heart because you love people, and not because you're gonna get something back. And that is one of the most important things that I'm trying to instill in my, my kids. This is the whole entire reason why I do it. Nothing else. I don't care if I make a single dime off of this, nor do I care if I get famous. It's not about famous. I, 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 I don't care. It's just about leaving that impact for my kids if I'm gone tomorrow. Death will scare the crap out of you. Death will, will put a lot of things in perspective. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and I, I don't know if you remember, you probably remember, uh, because a year ago, I was weighing in at 219. And my, my uh, it's not my heaviest, but I was pretty heavy. I was considered obese. I was pre-diabetic with high cholesterol. And, uh, you know, I had... I have that running in my family. 
So, you know, years after years of telling myself, I need to get healthier, I need to get healthier, I need to get healthier. Last, last year was like, man, I have too many uh, friends and family and people that I see on social media that are my age and even younger passing away because of these health problems. I'm like, dude, I want to be able to see my kids when they, they have their own kids and, you know, when they graduate and all that stuff. And I'm not helping the situation. So I took it upon myself. And uh, now I'm weighing at 160, no longer pre-diabetic, mm -hmm. uh, no high cholesterol. And, uh, and I'm I, I, like we were talking about it before, man, I'm doing things that I've never thought in my lifetime that I would do. I'm doing a Spartan 10K in May. Uh, just to challenge myself, just to see if I could do it. And if I can't do it, at least I tried. You know, I am getting old. I don't feel uh, as young as I used to, but I feel healthier. Yeah. To close out the entire interview, which was one of my favorite parts, we ended up talking about failure and how, especially in the case of magic, failure can actually teach you a lot more than successes ever can. You know, your experiences that you have in life, even if they're failures or if they're successes, failures are more important than successes, to be honest with you, right? Yeah. I mean, they really are because you, you get, it's a learning experience. As hard as those failures are, uh, you know, you'll learn from them and you have to push through them. Uh, but the, 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 the thing is, uh, like, including myself, because I'm still trying to learn this new skill is that try not to get down on yourself when you do have those failures. Like you, you, you had that, that moment in that situation where you just like, man, this is not what I want to do. This is, I expected more and all that good stuff, but yeah, but you learn from it. You learn something that you took that you still think about and it made you a better person. Right. And it improved your, 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 just your outlook on things. And it improved your pockets too, even though you don't spend it, it improved your pockets too. So it's just, you know, take those failures, magic, life. Even if you have a bad show, I've had many bad shows where I'm just like, man, that was just not fun. But ask yourself, what can I learn from this? What happened? Where, where it put me in the bad mood. What can I do the next time to, to improve this situation? Sometimes it's out of your hand. It's something you cannot do. But you got to realize that, you know, just say, yeah, that there's nothing I can do, but have a better attitude about it or something like that. But like I said, we're all human. We all have bad days. We could have this outlook one minute and then the next minute you're just like, man, this is just crappy. You know what I mean? And, and, and again, I would have never like... I would have never learned that lesson if I hadn't bought, like bombed that night, if then I hadn't worked out that way, you know what I mean? But it's crazy how it's stuck in your mind that, that it's just like a lifelong lesson that you've learned that you're, you, you'll come back to every now and then. And you're like, you remember this time, self, do you remember this time? And this is the way we got through it. And this is the way we'll try to avoid this the next time. Um, but like I said, we're all human. Things happen. You're gonna. You might encounter that situation again, but you'll remember. Like I, will, I went through this before. I know how to kind of cope with it, for the most part. And that's where the interview ended. I sort of put off editing it. I got a little lazy, but it ended up working out because fast forward to July, Jonathan was headlining a show called Flavors of Magic at the Flea Theater in New York City. So I knew I got to go out and see him. So you know, it really was amazing to be able to see him go out there and perform. Uh, and see this act that was very clearly well refined over many years uh, take form, take shape right in front of me. And one thing that I thought was really funny, again, was that his act had magic and entertainment in it. So I guess he didn't have to choose after all. Again, this video was supposed to be the video companion of the blog article that I wrote. So if you want to go check that out, again, that's markomatroni.com slash blog. Take a look at all those articles, especially if you're a magician. I think you'll appreciate them a little more. Uh, and yeah, this was really fun. I, again, I wanted to thank Jonathan for doing this. He's a great person, you know, when the camera's on and off and uh, a great magician. And we had, we had a lot of fun being able to do all this stuff. And I'm, I hope I can bring some more of these interviews to you guys in the future. So again, I really wanted to thank Jonathan for, for doing all this for me and allowing me to interview him. 
it really was a good experience and it really put me outside my comfort zone to, you know, to interview him in real time and have all my questions ready and adapt what he was saying and, and build off of that. All these were new skills that I was just now getting. And uh, it really was fun, I, you know, and I, I got to make this piece of content for you guys. So I really hope you enjoyed everything. Uh, again, Jonathan's uh, socials are his Instagram at molo underscore magic. I'll leave a link for that in the description. And of course, jonathanmolo.com if you want to learn more about him. In that case, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Peace.